Welcome back. We are going to dig into chapter 7.2, Meiosis. Uh, this is a lot, so I, I want to encourage you to go grab the figures out of the book before we start so that you can be taking notes and referring back to it as we dig into it. Um, I also want to encourage you to write down observations where you notice similarities between meiosis and mitosis from chapter six. All right. Sexual reproduction necessitates the fusion of two individual cells, each containing one set of chromosomes, All right? So that, that two, those two haploid cells can fuse. Uh, this union results in a cell with two sets of chromosomes known as its ploidy level, so diploid if there are two copies. Haploid cells have one set of chromosomes while diploids have two sets of chromosomes. Um, to maintain the reproductive cycle without a continual doubling of chromosome sets, sexual reproduction incorporates a nuclear division process called meiosis. Um, as a fun little side note, plants sometimes do some weird stuff where they duplicate chromosomes and keep them, but we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit maybe later. Um, the majority of animal and plants uh, are diploid. Uh, so they've got two sets of chromosomes in their somatic cells. Uh, which are the non-reproductive cells. Uh, these cells contain uh, homologous chromosomes, paired, paired sets with genes for the same traits in identical positions along their length. So each set of chromosomes, homologous chromosomes, they're not identical, okay? They're homologous, they're, they're very similar. Um, so let's, very quickly, let's say you have a parent who has um, blue eyes and a parent who has brown eyes. Um, and that the trait they passed on to you, your blue-eyed parent can only pass on blue, but let's say your brown-eyed parent passed on brown. If we were to look at those chromosomes at that site, the site, the locus of the eye color gene, um, we would see one chromosome would have blue, the allele for blue, and one would have the allele for brown. They would be in the same spot on these homologous chromosomes. Hopefully that helps, helps you understand. Um, Let's see, so diploid organisms inherit one set um, of each homologous chromosomes from each parent. So one from the genetic mother and one from the genetic father, forming a complete set of chromosomes, diploid. In animals, haploid cells carrying a single copy of each homologous chromosome exist solely within gametes, only in sperm and eggs, uh, which will then combine, will fuse uh, to produce the diploid cell a process we call fertilization. Meiosis closely resembles mitosis. It's gonna generate um, these haploid cells through nuclear division, just like, we saw with, just like we saw with mitosis. But unlike mitosis, which produces those genetically identical daughter cells, right? Um, we're gonna see uh, a round of chromosome duplication and two rounds of nuclear division. Uh, this reduces the chromosome sets from two to one in the four final daughter cells. Uh, so although meiosis is gonna utilize some similar mechanisms to mitosis, uh, the, final, the final stage, the final product at the end is not the same. So mitosis, we had two identical daughter cells. Meiosis, which will require two rounds of division, will lead to four non-identical unique daughter cells. Um, let's see, so uh, meiosis like I said, is divided into two rounds. We have meiosis one, which has a prophase one, prometaphase one, on and on, and, and is very similar uh, to mitosis. And then we have meiosis two with prophase two, prometaphase two, they, they're all named the same way, just with a one or a two at the end. Uh, meiosis one is gonna decrease the chromosome sets and introduce um, genetic diversity through recombination, while meiosis two is gonna resemble mitosis in its reducing of ploidy level. So we kind of have parts of mitosis that show up in both, um, but it is this wholly unique process. All right, so meiosis begins with an interphase comprising of G1, S, and G2 phases, just like we saw with mitosis. Um, G1 is primarily focused on cell growth. Uh, S is going to entail DNA replication, resulting in pairs of identical copies of sister chromatids, 
um, held together at their centromeres until meiosis II. And then G2 involves the final preparations for meiosis. Um, during DNA duplication in the S phase, each chromosome is going to form two identical sister chromatids joined at the centromere, um, and then later set, they'll later be separated um, in meiosis II. In animal cells, centrosomes organizing the mitotic spindle uh, microtubules also are going to replicate. So it's going to set the stage for this initial uh, meiotic phase. Okay. In early prophase one, chromosomes become visible under the microscope as um, the nuclear envelope begins to break down, just like we've seen before. Um, proteins associated with homologous chromosomes bring them close together in a process known as synapsis. So we're going to line those homologous chromosomes up. Um, during synapsis, uh, during synapsis um, genes on the chromatids of homologous chromosomes, they're going to align precisely. And this alignment allows for the exchange of chromosome segments between non-sister homologous chromatids. Um, we call this crossing over, and you can see kind of a cartoon image of it on the slide. The visual result of this exchange um, is seen as chiasmata, so or chiasma, where you have this um, mixture. You now have each each chromosome is now a mixture of the homologous chromosomes, unique and different from what they originally were. As prophase one continues, the close association between homologous chromosomes begins to weaken. Uh, while the chromosomes further condense, while they rather while they further condense. Um, however, the homologous chromosomes remain connected at the chiasmata, um, and the number of chiasmata varies depending on the species and chromosome length, um, and that's a, a position that can vary quite a bit. All right. Um, by the end of prophase one, the pairs are held together only at the chiasmata, and they are referred to as tetrads because all four sister chromatids of each pair of homologous chromosomes are now visible. Um, crossover events during prophase one are the initial source of genetic diversity uh, from meiosis. A single crossover event between non-sister homologous chromatids results in reciprocal exchange of equivalent DNA uh, between the maternal and the paternal chromosome, okay? So what you've done is you've taken the chromosome from your mom and the chromosome from your genetic dad, and you've kind of scrambled them up a little bit. Um, not completely, like you can see in the picture, like that chromosome in the cartoon, they just swapped ends. Um, and sometimes it's just an end, sometimes it's parts in the middle, uh, it, it varies. Um, all right, so what's cool is this means that the now the sister chromatids that you have are no longer identical. They, they are non-identical. You have these unique exchanges going on. Uh, so it's a novel blend of maternal and paternal genes, uh, which is part of, part of, not the only part, but part of how we end up looking like a little bit of both our parents. Um, during prometaphase one, um, a really important event is the attachment of the spindle fiber microtubules two kinetochore proteins that are located at the centromeres. Just like we saw in mitosis, right? This is really, really important that this happen properly. Um, microtubules originate from the centrosome at opposite poles of the cell, and they're gonna extend towards the cell center. Um, by the end of prometaphase one, each tetrad is connected to microtubules from both poles. One homologous chromosome attaches to one pole, while the other homologous chromosome attaches to the opposite pole. Uh, these homologous chromosomes remain joined at the chiasmata, uh, and the nuclear membrane has fully disintegrated at this point. As we shift into metaphase one, the homologous chromosomes align at the cell center with their kinetochores pointing towards the opposite poles. Um, the specific orientation of each homologous chromosome pair at the cell's midpoint is random, okay? So the order in which they are, it's not like it's not like the chromosomes know, oh, okay, put one here and two there. That part's random. Um, let's see, uh, and this randomness is known as independent assortment, uh, and it forms the basis for generating the second form of genetic diversity in 
in offspring. So, you know, it's, they're just all lined up and they're gonna, they're gonna move apart. Okay. So, um, if we think about humans, so we have a set of 23 chromosomes that originates from mother's egg and another set of 23 chromosomes that originate from the father's sperm. During metaphase one, these pairs gather at the cell's midpoint between the two poles. Uh, because microtubule fibers have an equal chance of encountering a maternal or paternal inherited chromosome, um, the arrangement of tetrads on the metaphase plate is completely random. So, okay, so let's say we're looking at chromosome four. Well, chromosome four, maybe here's the sister chromatids from mom and here's the sister chromatids from dad. But maybe for chromosome eight, it's reversed. Chromosomes from mom are on the same side as the one from dad for chromosome four and so on. So it's, it's completely random. So this is gonna create even more uniqueness in the resulting daughter cells. Okay. Um, in every cell undergoing meiosis, the arrangement of tetrads is different. Okay, so the number of possible variation depends on the number of chromosomes in each set. Um, then there are two potential orientations for each tetrad, resulting in a um, number of alignments equal to two n, so however many tetrads you have, uh, where n is the number of chromosomes per set. Um, in the case of humans with 23 pairs, uh, this results in over 8 million, that's 2 to the 23rd possible orientations. Um, and this does not account for the variability introduced by the crossover events that happened with the sister chromatids earlier. So this is just this huge, huge amount of uh, potential diversity, which again is you know, it's one of those things. If you have siblings, maybe you and your siblings look a lot alike, or maybe you don't. Um, you know, it, it just depends on how everything aligned and crossed over and went through all of that. All right, uh, meiosis has two genetic consequences. Crossover events from prophase one recombine maternal and paternal genes. So the ones from you, your parents, this isn't happening at the fertilization step. This is happening inside you as an individual as you produce your own gametes. Sometimes that confuses people. Okay, so first genetic consequence. Crossover events during prophase one recombine maternal and paternal genes within each homologous pair. And the random assortment of tetrads during metaphase one produces a distinct combination of maternal and paternal chromosomes that will ultimately make their way into the gamete. The gamete. So we're still talking about forming an egg or a sperm cell, right? Um, with more chromosomes, the number of possible arrangements increases dramatically, right? Like said, millions and millions of possibilities for humans. Um, and there are other organisms with many more chromosomes than we have, and some with less. In anaphase one, spindle fibers are gonna pull linked chromosomes apart. Um, the sister chromatids are gonna remain at the, joined at the centromere, and the chiasmatic connections are gonna break. Um, and they're gonna do that as the fibers attach, uh, as fibers attached um, to fuse kinetic cores, separate the homologous chromosomes. They're gonna break apart. Um, in telophase one, the separated chromosomes are gonna reach the opposite poles. So telophase events vary among species, but some see chromosomes um, that are gonna decondense and the nuclear envelope may reform. Um, and other cytokinesis will separate the cytoplasmic components into two daughter cells without the nucleus reforming at all. Um, Cytokinesis mechanisms also differ. Um, we have the cleavage furrow in animals and some fungi, the cell plate in plants um, that are gonna lead to that, that's gonna lead to that cell wall formation like we saw in mitosis. Um, each pole has one of each homologous chromosome pair, making these cells haploid. Uh, despite sister chromatids originating uh, from the same chromosome, they're no longer identical due to crossovers. This is a little confusing. So you still have two copies of each chromosome, but they're they're no longer identical. So so we we are not dealing with the same thing as we saw like in mitosis. Okay. So now we can move into meiosis 2. This is where we're going to split connected sister chromatids 
in the haploid cells from meiosis one, resulting in four haploid cells. So some species enter a brief interphase here called interkinesis before they enter meiosis two, um, and there's no DNA duplication that will occur. So it's just a kind of a pause. Um, in fact, uh, this is we see this in, um, in humans, um, where your a lot of your eggs will go through this point. They reach up to um, eggs and sperm um, up to meiosis, finish meiosis one. They're kind of paused waiting for meiosis two to occur. Um, the two meiosis one produced cells are gonna go through meiosis two concurrently, so at the same time, and this is gonna resemble mitotic division of haploid cells. In prophase two, chromosomes may recondense uh, and nuclear envelope fragments, it's gonna fragment into um, vesicles. All right, so like we talked about, some, some do, right? Some. Uh, Sometimes the chromosomes kind of loosen back up and the nuclear envelope will form during that interkinesis phase. Um, so you have, to, you have to break that back down before you can move into uh, prophase two. So if that happened, that's gonna happen. You're gonna have that nuclear envelope break back down. Um, duplicated centrosomes are gonna move apart, forming new spindles. And in prometaphase two, the nuclear envelope will fully break down if it reformed at all. Uh, and each sister chromatid is gonna develop an individual kinetochore. And then we're gonna attach the microtubules from opposite poles uh, to those kinetic cores. Metaphase two sees the sister chromatids maximally condensed nice and, and aligned at the cell's center, okay? So very much, very much like we can think of uh, what happens during mitosis. Um, then anaphase two is gonna separate the sister chromatids, moving them to opposite poles. In telophase two, we're gonna see chromosomes arrive at the opposite poles and they're gonna to start to decondense and the nuclear envelope is going to reform around them. Cytokinesis divides the two cells into the four genetically unique haploid cells. And um, these newly produced cells are both um, haploid, containing one set of chromosomes. Um, let's see, they're genetically unique due to random assortment of the paternal and maternal homologs and recombination of maternal and paternal chromosome segments, segments during crossing over. Uh, mitosis and meiosis both form, are both forms of nuclear division in, in eukaryotic cells, right? And they share some similarities, but the yield is distinct. So mitosis is a single division resulting in two nuclei, typically forming two new cells with identical genetic content as the, as the original. Um, you know, maybe a couple of little minor mutation errors, but for the most part, they're genetically identical. Um, these nuclei are gonna have the same, uh, same chromosome set count, uh, either one haploid or two diploid, depending on the, the, uh, the life cycle of the organism. And conversely, uh, meiosis is going to involve two divisions resulting in four nuclei that are typically, you know, these are going to be four unique cells and uniquely different from the parent cell at the beginning. The nuclei from meiosis um, are, they are never genetically identical. Each is going to contain only one chromosome set, which is half the original diploid set. Um, and that's, you know, that's gonna form, right? Those are gonna form your gametes, your sperm and your egg. That's what comes from that. Um, these differing outcomes um, are primarily due to differences in chromosome behavior during the processes, um, with the most variations occurring in meiosis one, um, with this distinct nuclear division, um, different is different from, meio from mitosis. So during meiosis one, homologous chromosome pairs associate they're gonna to bind together. They're gonna to experience that chiasmata at the crossover between sister chromatids um, and align in tetrads at the metaphase plate. Spindle fibers from opposite poles are gonna to attach to each kinetochore and they're going to, um, each kinetochore of a homologue within the tetrad. Uh, and then that's, that's something unique to meiosis one. Uh, meiosis one reduces the chromosome set count from two to one because the homologous chromosomes for, you know, they move to the opposite poles, but they also, the sister chromatids are no longer identical. So it's no longer, uh, it's no longer diploid. Um, unlike mitosis, right, where we're gonna maintain our ploidy level, um, even though it no longer has two sister chromatids, each cell's gonna get one sister chromatid. Um, 
you may want to look back at the at mitosis at your sketches of that so you can kind of keep it straight in your head uh all right meiosis one reduces the chromosome set count um like i said from um diploid to haploid and call this a reduction division um Mitosis maintains ploidy level. Meiosis II is going to resemble mitotic division a little bit more closely. In this phase, the duplicated chromosomes, only one set, uh, align at the cell center um, with divided kinetic cores attached to spindle fibers from opposite poles. And during anaphase II, similar again to mitosis, um, or mitotic anaphase, the kinetic cores are going to split and pull one sister chromatid to each pole. But in mitosis, those sister chromatids are identical. In meiosis two, those sister chromatids are non-identical. Um, let's see. So cells from mitosis are going to contribute to growth, tissue repair, and asexual reproduction, producing more uh, more cells that you might need, or you know, we're talking about like prokaryotes, make more identical copies. But meiosis produced cells in this diploid in diploid dominant organisms uh, like animals solely participate in reproduction they don't serve any other role in in your cellular functioning they're just part of sexual reproduction all right we made it through i know that was a lot um, i really really strongly encourage you to pull up the book and go through each of the steps write what parts are similar to the same steps of mitosis, where they differ, um, and try to say the words as you're doing it. It's very easy, like come test time, to kind of mix up meiosis and mitosis in your head and the different steps. All right, I will see you in our next video.